uh, thanks for coming for my talk. Uh, I'm Jing Su Chen, at, uh, assistant professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering in NCTU. The topic is about control and challenge of multi-order systems, which I have, be, I have been doing this topic for years, and three years in NCTU. And so there are four or five topics will be covered today. And the first one is about drone uh, combined with 5G networks. And there are some control problems and challenge in there. And the second one is about um, tracking, uh, tracking a moving target. And there are some um, problems that we, we have been dealing with, such as uh, we don't assume, we relax the assumption about uh, the uh, target motion because some literature assume that the target can only move in a very uh, special uh, motion pattern, such as move in a straight line, and we relax that assumption. And the third one is about slam and motion planning for autonomous, autonomous UAV. That means we, uh, we do slam, and based on the slam and the mapping, we can do the uh, motion planning for the UAV and to achieve a pro, uh, autonomous flight. And the fourth topic is about reinforcement learning in uh, autonomous flight. And it's a bit different from here because here we focus more on the end-to-end -end approach, end-to-end -end architecture. And the last one, the last one on this is about distributed control UAVs, where we will employ uh, multiple UAVs to achieve a global objective or the same objective. So the first one, uh, this is the uh, this is a project done by um, done in UA, uh, in NCTU, and that's the PI is the is the president of ours. Uh, university. So the motivation is that we want to provide a data link, data, data service to the end user on the ground. Uh, the scenario uh, is like uh, in the disaster, the data service might not work and we need to provide a mobile data service to the end user. So instead of the tower, we use a uh, moving platform, which is an uh, airship, this balloon. And it carry a, a transmitter that is a, this a MMWF backhaul, which have a high value communication bandwidth. And that, that, that data can be done linked to a drone, which is a, a more agile moving platform. It can track the cloud and provide direct service to the cloud, as well as have a good alignment to the airship because this this is 5G network and the the data service is very the quality is very uh, sensitive to the alignment. So we need to control drone to not only follow the cloud but uh, align with the uh, uh, airship for being alignment. So we focus more on the drone and the airship here. So uh, the hardware on the UAV is only a camera. The only sensor is the camera. The camera is used to search for an April attack on the airship. And on the other hand, it can provide downlink to the uh, end user, which represent a uh, smartphone here. So this is a real scenario where we have a, a drone cruiser which fly up high in the sky and uh, we have a UAV with camera here and some GPS positioning sensor. So it knows, it tells robot uh, the UAV where it is and this camera is to use for searching this April tag attached near the receiver on the UAV, on the drone cruiser. So initially, the drone can take off from anywhere, which this tag might not be in the field of view, but as long as it can move closer to the uh, air cruiser, then it can start to search for this tag. 
because this tag provides more uh, local information about where the receiver. Then we can do the uh, control process. So this is the uh, control architecture where the control, the desired command to the controller is the desired feature position. And that's the feature point, loca location of the feature point in the center of the image. This is our uh, control objective. And the true signal is the tag, the position of the tag in the image, in the image. So uh, the difference characterizes the, dif the, the, the mismatch between the uh, center position and the current tag position. So if the uh, control error, the, this control error is, if this control error is zero, that means that the tag will appears in the center of image because we have controlled the UAVs. So the controller will, uh, to compensate this error, the controller will generate a command velocity to the UAV so it can move in the right direction, right velocity until to the right position, okay? So after this iteration, uh, the next step will be the camera. It will recapture the image again to search for this tag, okay, this tag. Uh, another information to this uh, UKF, the filter is, the estimator is that not only this image, but also the GPS, which represent the uh, position of the UAVs. So you suppose the uh, input we can, to the, Im to the uh, filter, we can estimate the velocity of the UA, uh, this drone cruiser. And this, this, this velocity is very important because in the outdoor environment, uh, especially in Shinzu, the disturbance, the wind can be very heavy, you know. So this can uh, change the, or it can affect the motion of the drone cruiser, the target you want to track. So this term is very important. So the first time is to compensate the tracking air, and this one is the, to facilitate the tracking performance. So this is the experiment we, uh, we have conducted. So initially the UAV is here, is the drone cruiser, although it's in, in indoor environment, but the concept of us. Experiment, but taken from a first person view. So you can see here is the uh, first camera looking forward, and this one is the second camera looking upward to search for the ever attack. And this one is uh, used for localization because we use the feature point, which is our the red dots to uh, calculate where the drone is. So it's for localization. And the green rectangle here is the uh, camera frame. And you can, later on, you can see a trajectory, the green trajectory, which is the uh, visual inertia odometry.
Okay, the tag, the tag is here. So once you search the tag, then you will be UAB will be controlled to remain a constant distance. Because the closer the distance, the higher the transmission rate. Hmm? Okay, okay, okay. Sorry. Okay, so here comes the sound, but this one, this video doesn't have any sound, so audio. So uh, next one, this one is uh, the uh, John Cooser, the concept, the first generation of the John Cooser. So on top of this drone, we, we build a balloon with helium, so it can provide extra lift to the drone and, and as to uh, extend the battery life. So with this helium, uh, we, we, we estimate that it can uh, provide up to three times the flight time, which is uh, 90, uh, 90 minutes. Okay, originally it was 30 minutes. And here is the uh, hardware we have with G, uh, RTK, a flight controller uh, for the drone cruiser and do the experiment. And you can see from the tree that the wind is pretty heavy, so it's not a good weather condition for the flight test. So there are still some limitations for the vacation. Okay, so we still working on it. So in this, ca this case, we use the remote controller, but in the future, it will be autonomous. Okay. So now we will go ahead to the second topic about target tracking control. So the topic is motion prediction and robust tracking control of a dynamic and temporarily occluded target by an UAV. So compared to the conventional approach, conventional or existing literature, the difference is that we consider the occlusion case because like in the picture shown here, uh, when the drone trying to track a target, it might be occluded by some obstacles in the urban area. So this is, this, this, uh, this, this is the, um, uh, one of the challenges. And the second one is uh, we relax the constraint, the motion, uh, the assumption that uh, most of the target only move in a straight line, in which case it will be easier for motion prediction. But we don't, in this case, in this work, we don't make any assumptions. And the third one is we also can control this UAV to remain at a constant angle of view, like uh, it always stay on the left of the target. And that's not quite easy because you, to do that, you need to know where you are related to the target. That means that you have find a way to detect the angle of view, right? So we use Yolo Network to do that. And the third one is remain a specific de distance, which means that you can uh, remain a constant uh, depth to the target. Okay, you can do, you can track the target in 2D motion. Here's the uh, kinematics model we have. Uh, target is here, and this rectangle represents the image frame. So whatever you see in, in, the, 
in the image you is uh, only 2D information, but in real case, the target is moving in 3D. So we want to use 2D measurement to recover the 3D information. So the rate, these two red, red vectors are the unknowns. And so this one is the target position. This is the relative position with respect to the uh, image or the uh, UAV. And we also want to estimate the target velocity in the 3D space. And by taking the time derivative on this red ink, the relative position, we can get the uh, interaction, uh, the velocity. And uh, by defining the states, the states uh, is defined as a, the signal that we want to estimate. So it is a, uh, a signal from the, can be measured by the image and the target position and target velocity. So using the previous equation and, and, and this one, we can get this uh, dynamics equation and they will be used in the uh, command field uh, UKF for estimation. So the measure, measurement model here is uh, the image that captured by the onboard camera on the UAV. So it, given the image, uh, you can see a car and we it will also generate a bounding box that's obtained by the Yolo network. Uh, we we pre-trained by 100,000 ima uh, images on the, in the simulator, but it's, it still can be used on the real case for detecting the, 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 the real, real car in, the, in the, our, uh, our environment. So uh, what is important here is the, not only the size of the bounding box, but also the center of the uh, bounding box, this red dot. Because the position, the 2D position of this red dot is represent or can be used to measure uh, the, uh, can be used to estimate the, the 3D velocity of the target and the positions based on the previous dynamics model. And this one is how, is a short demonstration about how we, uh, uh, we use the uh, network to detect the orientation of the, the target. So we use a model car, this model car, and it tells you, given that image, it will give you a bounding box as well as the angle of view. So it's this angle, phi. And there's an ambiguity between uh, the, the front side and the rear side because they, are, they look very similar. Like in, in this time, it do from the rear, but it, it, it's ambiguous. Okay, and this one is for in the uh, real life. We we borrow a car and test on this car in real time. So. Uh, this this camera this image is captured by the camera on the UAV and we we really, we, we did a flight test and here shows the result the pose of the target and here's the license plate recognition because it haven't seen the license plate but once it can it's in the field of view they will generate result and the result this one is the red one is the failure rate and this one is success rate. But you can see that this rate, the success rate is very sensitive to the angle of view. So you might wonder what kind of application we can leverage for, uh, what kind of uh, application we can use leveraging this technique. Like uh, you can replace the step that uh, given a ticket to the car parking on the roadside, right? If you can know, uh, so once the, the, the UAV take off, uh, if it, it knows this angle, if the UAV can generate, uh, it knows this angle, then it knows where 
it is related to this vehicle, right? So it can then move to the front or the, to, the, to the rear side of the vehicle and do the license plate de de detection and recognition. So they can, um, they can automate some task and replace some labor force. Okay. So back to the Yolo network, this is the network we design and do the training on this one to generate posts and bounding box. So uh, given the dynamics and the measurement, uh, then we can do the UKF. And, but one more, one, more, one more thing that uh, we need to mention is we need to do the online estimation on the covariance metrics because the, uh, the process noise and the measurement noise are pretty significant. And if we do just fine tune by hand, it might, the, the model might not, the, the UKF might not converge. So we do the online estimation, which give us a lot of uh, save us some time to do the fine tune. And the controller here is, uh, is designed by a, in this form. And the uh, error signal, as I mentioned before, is the feature error. Okay, when this error is zero, that means the target will be in the center of the image. So uh, based on this and the interaction metrics, we can generate the controller, which is the velocity of the UAVs. So given that error and the, the motion of the target, we can calculate what we what the velocity of the UAV is. Okay, this is the controller. Okay, and this is the uh, control architecture, very similar to the previous one. But uh, this one is for without the case without occlusion, and the next one is the case for when with the presence of occlusion. So given that uh, the occlusion. Uh, we will switch from this branch to this branch because there is no measurement. So camera image, the image will be used this. So we don't use the image for this stage. We use the previous data, which is the target position and velocity. They, were, they are stored in the memory. So it will be a, a history data, the most current history data in the memory. And given that data, we can do uh, quadratic programming to generate, to predict the target velocity and uh, acceleration. So they will be accurate to approximate the target velocity in the short period of time, like uh, three seconds. So this still give us a very, uh, very, it's still very helpful information. So the estimation will go into the UKF as before, and it can generate the target velocity. And here's the QP that we use to uh, calculate the motion pattern of the target. And this is the model that defined as a, we use a higher order polynomial to approximate the velocity. So here's the cost function we need to uh, minimize such that we can approximate the target motion pattern. Another constraint is that we need to make sure the path, the, 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 the motion pattern generated from this model is achievable because we don't want to uh, predict a motion that is too aggressive in the sense that the acceleration is too large, which is not possible, right? Because the acceleration of a car is in some range for general vehicles, not for sports car. So here we, we did uh, simulation and experiment. This one is the, the simulation. So on the bottom right, you can see the ground truth velocity and the estimated velocity. So this is the, uh, uh, the one without occlusion. So it, 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 it fails, but the second one we use QP.
So he will be here, the target here. The remain on the uh, left hand side, the 90, uh, 90 degree angle of view. Okay. And this is the result uh, with the QB. The, uh, estimating a more stream pattern, we can have a better tracking performance. And the, the one on the right is not uh, having any QP. And the yellow color, the, 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 re, the period with yellow color represent the, uh, with the presence of occlusion. So you can see the, uh, the performance here is very different. And the, um, this one uh, is the estimate of relative angle generated by the YOLO. So it's quite accurate. It is enough for uh, this application. It's not super accurate, but it's enough. And we did the experiment. So this one, we don't use, we don't consider occlusion, so we don't use QP. So it proved that the QP is quite effective in our case. Okay, and the, then uh, the third topic is about stem and moiety planning for autonomous ERV. So um, because stem is uh, stands for simultaneous localization and mapping, and this this uh, this is the map that we uh, generate by sweeping our lab using a LiDAR. So uh, the color, the area with color will represent the obstacles that have been occupied by obstacles. And this open area is the, uh, is the region that can be uh, fly by the UAV. So we assume that this, it takes off from here and it need to reach to this position and in, uh, in, a, in a very, uh, in the fancy test, in the shortest pace. Us. And at the same time, you need to avoid these obstacles. So we, we, we use a search-based uh, uh, approach to find the trajectory because uh, you want it to, to be fast, as fast as possible to reach to a destination, but you need to consider the physical constraint because the, 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 uh, mode, the, the acceleration can be limited because uh, the Road, the motor on the UAV might not be super powerful, so you need to consider this fact. So you want to, you don't want to generate a path that's too aggressive. So we have a constraint here that uh, X is the, the F is the model of the UAVs. So in this case, the path generated will be not too aggressive, but it still can uh, uh, steal the shortest path. And this is the whole way in our department. So it's all autonomous. After it take off, then it's all controlled by itself. The wire here is is a safety for safety concern, not for like a transmission or. Others. Okay. Uh, then the next topic is reinforcement learning based approach for autonomous flight. And uh, later on, the second topic is about UGV. So let's first have a look. 
at the first one. So as we know that uh, reinforcement learning has been the core area in many different uh, fields, such as engineering, computer science, even mathematics. So it's very important that uh, how we can use leverage IL to do uh, application in robotics. So th this one is a very, very primary result that we use IL to do the control, the attitude control. And we want to replace the IL, use IL to replace conventional controller because uh, control, conventional controller have some limitations. It only stabilize, it can only be stabilized near the uh, equivalent point. But using IL, it can, it can be operated in any condition. So we have several UAVs trained at the same time. And the objective is to stay at the red dot for, for, for all time. And it can start, take off from anywhere in any condition, in any velocity. But it finally, you need to reach to this destination and remain stationary. You can see that some might still fail, but uh, most of them are pretty good. Okay, so the next one is more interesting. Um, because the, the previous one is for UAV to be stationary at a given, at a given point. But now we give a, a, a gate and we want the robot to pass through the gate without telling him where the gate is, where the, uh, what's the orientation of the gate. So we train a deep network and we want the robot to achieve this uh, by end-to-end -end approach. That means that uh, we only give the, the robot this image, the first person view image. So it only tells what he can see and making the decision, the policies to determine how it can fly through the gate. So this is what, this is what the UAV see and um, it needs to determine how it can fly in order to pass in through the gate. And the red dot here is some auxiliary signal that is uh, generally is a virtual signal. It, it's not real signal. So in the previous few image, you can see the the gate is all in the image. But later on, you will see that the the robot only see parts of the frames, not the full information, but it still can make the right decision for passing through the gate. Like this one, you can see that the robot only see only, only half of the frame, but it still can fly through the gate. So this is beyond, this is really beyond what, uh, our imagination during the training. So the next one is passing through uh, multiple gates, a series of gates. kind of stop and go, stop and go, because we haven't, it's still in the middle of the, of the, of, of the process. Um, we have a roadmap. Uh, at the beginning, we passing through the gate with the same size. Later on, we will uh, replace the gate by different size. And uh, given that image, it's hard for the UAV to tell which one is closer, which one is far away from the UAV. So it's hard to make decision, but once the UV can move and detect several frames, then it can it can it should be able to understand which one is far away and which one is closer. So we haven't been there yet, but it's in our roadmap. Okay, and the next one is for ground vehicle. The reason, um, so the reason we, 
we did ground vehicle for using a reinforcement learning approach is that we implement the LiDAR on the ground vehicle and want to do end-to-end -end approach. That means that after we after the, the network is, is well trained, then we can import the whole network to the UAV and use the same LiDAR and it can make it the right plot, uh, control policy. But uh, there's some problem here. Uh, so the one on the left is a conventional approach, which is potential field master. It's not, uh, it's not, it's only by some uh, conventional algorithm. It's not, it's not obtained by learning. And the one on the right is uh, DTBG approach, which is a uh, RL approach. Okay, so they perform almost the same. Uh, it's hard to tell which one is good, which is one not, which one is bad. And later on, we we not only use DTPG but also use D DTPG N from demonstration. That means that there's an expert. We you can learn from expert. The demonstration means that the expert data. So we put the expert data uh, to the database and uh, mix with the the uh, current data so they can do supervised learning. And the performance will, will be better uh, for the, uh, once the expert data is engaged. So we can see from here that the, the, the best performance is the uh, DTPG from demonstration. Here's DTPG from the, oh, so these three are all from demonstration. So they all perform better than the conventional approach. And the success rate, which is 90%, okay, but it's hard to uh, go further up in, uh, by after uh, more training, because uh, that's the main drawback of deep learning, is a black box, and it's hard to uh, further improve the performance. So we kind of stuck here, and uh, yeah. So uh, okay. So the success rate, success rate is defined as uh, you need to. So the, the the green color, the green dot is the destination. So you need to move. You need to avoid the obstacles and get to the destination, that will be defined as success. If you collide with any obstacles, they will be defined as fail. So later on, we add moving targets, moving, uh, moving obstacles. Uh, sorry, this one. We not only have, uh, not only have stationary obstacles, but also have moving obstacles. And the green dot is the uh, target you need to reach. And here we also uh, use an auxiliary task network into in the putting in front of the original network, so it can be used to detect whether the obstacle is stationary or dynamic. And that can help the uh, UAV to make the right decisions. Okay, so after the uh, simulation, we also did some, uh, do the uh, verify in the experiment. Here, and here's the experiment set up. We have a clear path vehicle, and we put the LiDAR sensor, the uh, IMU sensor. This is flight controller, but we uh, extract the IMU information out from this controller. And this is the computation, which is uh, Intel Nuke.
So you can see it, the, the, the vehicle can really avoid obstacles and goes to the destination. But the, the destination is not shown here. So in, in some cases, you can see that uh, it seems the vehicle is making a wrong decision and trying to hit the person. But uh, one of the reasons is that um, the radar sensor have some sensing limitation. It's the, the obstacles cannot be too close or too far away. So there might be one of the reasons that uh, it did not make in the avoidance. Okay, uh, the, the last topic is about distrib distributed control of UAVs. Um, the first topic is cooperative transportation without in inter-engine communication. So it's inspired from the nature that we, uh, so you can observe that the, the group of ants can transport their food or any goods uh, to layer home without any communication. But they, they can still do the same uh, objective, we define as global objective. So how, do it, how did they do it? Um, and we also want to uh, realize that in our drone application. So we employ two UAVs, one is the leader, which is on the left, one is the follower, but they don't, they don't communicate. And it's important because in some applications when a local environment, indoor environment is full of people, the, the communication link might fail because of the uh, inter interference. So it's important that if we can uh, design a controller that doesn't rely on uh, inter-agent communication, but they can still do cooperative tasks, that would be great. And, um, so to do that without communication, uh, the follower, is very hard for the follower to follow the leader. And the difference between leader and follower is that follower can receive human commands, so he knows where he needs to go um, in the future. But the follower doesn't have that information, he just uh, needs to follow the leader. So how can he follow the leader without exchange? Uh, data, uh, this is very difficult. So, in our case, we estimate this cable, the tension on this cable, because uh, when the leader is trying to move forward, the cable, the, the, the tension will, be, uh, will, will not be constant. And you can tell that, you also can tell that this direction is changing because originally it might be uh, vertical, in the vertical direction, but when the leader moves, the direction will be different. So here we define four stages of transportation. The first one is uh, they take off and hover at the same height. Then the leader move, to the, uh, move forward and uh, follow or follow up. So uh, in this case, we can sense the tension not only the magnitude, but also the direction. So uh, we can know that the follower is changing the direction, is moving. So to do that, we need to uh, do the model. Here's the model equation of motion for the follower. And th this is the thrust, total thrust of the UAV propellers. And this is the gra uh, gravity here. Um, this is the force from the te uh, cable tension. So using this model and the model from the payload, because payload uh, can deliver the signal from the leader to the follower. So the model for the payload is very important. Another issue is that uh, the estimate, when the follower estimate the leader force, the, they always exist some noise, 
And this noise, although it's not large, it's small, but it can give a false alarm on the trigger signal. And they can give a, uh, they can uh, have a bad trigger and cause some consequence. So we need to define some triggering thresholds here. It's kind of, it's not, it's not, it's easy, but it's not, it's not trivial. And here's the control architecture we have to, uh, for the follower. So in the follower, they were, they, we designed two controllers, force controller and the position controller. And only one controller is activated at a time. So it's triggered by some triggering mechanism that's determined by the force, as the, uh, force estimated by the follower, leader force estimated by the follower. So when this force is too small or too large, they will switch between two controllers. And here's the experiment. So the previous one, previous one is for 1D transportation, then later on we extend to 2D transportation. And in addition, uh, because uh, it's very hard to, uh, in some cases, you might want to, you might want the leader to change predefined trajectories because of some moving obstacles. So it has to change the directions. Uh, and the trajectories, but it's very hard for lead, uh, for the follower to uh, to to to, uh, to follow because uh, because conventional approach give the two agents the same trajectories, so then they don't need the complications. But this not this can be a that can be problematic because in the special case. When the leader changes to a new trajectory, the, the follower cannot follow. So in this case, we consider that so it can still change direction in, in uh, transit to a new direction. So this is the case that uh, we 
So uh, this is the first trajectory, and uh, because some um, um, urgent event that the leader was switched to a second traje trajectory. And here, this green dot is the transition point. So even without communication, without intelligent communication, uh, the leader can switch to any trajectory if you want. Okay, the second one, uh, the last one is the distributed information control. So um, the motivation is here that uh, the there's one leader and four followers. The di difference is uh, similar to the previous case that leader have more knowledge. Or for example, leader have only one have a sensor, but the follower doesn't have any sensor to sense the environments. So that means the leader have more knowledge, and he might also know where to go uh, because the trajectory is provided by the uh, users. And how the follower can know or can uh, follow the data is that it needs the uh, local communication, agent to agent communication, uh, to propagate the data information. So, for example, uh, agent three only have communication with leader and uh, agent one, but not, but not the number four and number two agent. Otherwise, the, the communication bandwidth will be saturated. So you only only use lo local communication. Local means that it communicate to neighboring agents. But this can still do a global objective, means that can do uh, travel at the same speed and remain a com constant configuration. And I will skip the technical part. And here we, uh, the main objective is to further reduce the inter-agent communications, but still uh, uh, achieve the control objective. And here's the controller design for each robot, uh, which is a distributed controller because the control here only use the neighboring information. And here's how we communicate because the communication only is not, it doesn't require continuous communication, only intermittent communication. And this is one of the contribution of this paper. Okay, and we do the stability analysis and also prove that the events between two communications uh, have a lower bound. The time have a period have a lower bound. So it doesn't require infinite, infinite number of communication. And we also did a simulation. The tracking error all converge to zero. And the experiment. So you can see the three UAV will fly with a constant, remain constant relative distance and using only one operator. So let me wrap up my talk. And uh, any questions?
which which topic? Number two. Uh, oh, this one. Um, yes, in this one. So in this one, uh, flight control is we uh, is together with the UAV, and we only provide. The controller we design only provide command velocity into the flight board, flight controller. So we, we don't control lower level uh, signals. We only give the uh, linear translational and rotational velocity for the UAV. Ah, uh, okay, okay. That's the... This one, no, um, no, not, not in this one. So in this one, we only give the signal input to the network is position and attitude, and position of the of the UAV and its attitude, as well as the target position, and that's the all that's all the signal we have for the network and the output of network will be the four propellers the velocity of the four propellers because flight control um, uh, flight control have its limitations if you if you fly uh, upside down it, it doesn't work so that means that using the IR approach you can fly take off from more aggressive angle, aggressive attitude. So like a flight control only fly around this hovering angle, okay, o o almost horizontal. If you fly too aggressive, that it doesn't work. But for this one, it has no limitation because the, if, as long as you give more training data into the training process, they will work. Uh, n not, I think a little bit aerodynamics, but uh, it, 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 con it considers the gravities. Um, so it's a good question, but I think the first question should be two questions, right? One is for UAV, one is for autonomous driving. Uh, the main difference. Main difference between the two, right? Yes. Um, so I will start with the second question, okay? And uh, second question is uh, we have, uh, we combine the RL Deep learning and the conventional approach, right? And it, is it possible to replace the, the whole architecture with only one single deep learning network, right? Uh, because I, I think for now it's not quite possible because for, for this case, uh, initially what you just mentioned is our idea in uh, in the very beginning of this project and it doesn't work because at that time uh, we do end-to-end -end learning, learning and the input is the image, the same as this one, but the output is the uh, road, uh, angular velocity of the propellers and it fails because 
Um, deep learning is hard to achieve 100% uh, accurate, right? You always have a loss. Uh, you have the, always have the lows. So success rate could be 95%. Uh, that would be pretty high, right? But the 5% difference can cause a lot of difference in this case because the 5% difference in angular velocity in the propeller, uh, the consequence is very uh, significant because the 5% can be the difference like uh, it fly straight forward or fly upward. For the 5%, it can fly 49 degree, but it should be horizontal. Yeah, so that's the big difference. And so then in this project, we changed to a different approach that we, the output of the network is not, is not the velocity of the propeller, but the position of the gate, the center position of the gate. Then we can combine with conventional approach, motion planning to uh, navigate through the gate. Yes. And these are many, uh, so this, this case, in this, in this approach is called, uh, someone will call it hierarchy approach. And that's getting more popular in the reinforcement learning uh, area. Yeah. And the first question, um, the, dif the difference. Uh, I think that's very, they are very big difference exists there. Uh, so the short answer is that the dynamics are different, but the sensing, the perception will be the same. But uh, perception means you, what you need, uh, you, the, the, the stuff you need to provide into the uh, network, right? Then the network generate actions. But because the dynamics are different, uh, the action will be different. But you can give the same perceptions, pretty much the same perceptions. So, uh, uh, and drone fly in the 3D space, I think they will be easier for the vehicles, the, the cars moving in the 2D environment and uh, because they give him more constraints in terms of avoid obstacles, there's not too much choice for the vehicle to avoid obstacles. And uh, in, on the ground, that uh, the most difficult part for the moving, uh, for autonomous driving for the vehicle is that uh, the moving obstacle is very tricky. For example, um, when you do autonomous driving on the highway, it's easier compared to uh, the, uh, the urban area because you might have bicycles, you have pedestrian, babies, uh, kids, not babies, baby cannot work, but kids and whose behavior is very hard to predict. So it's very complicated uh, compared to drones. Okay. So any other question? No? Okay, so if you don't have any questions, then let's end. Let's thank for the speaker. Okay, thank you. Come later.